Changing a system takes long. It's painful and it can cost life. <laughs> I am among the victims who have been sent on leave twice in my tenure of service to attempt to change. <laughs> twice. And you know in forces, the moment they put you aside, they can forget you. So we were there, we were about to go to bed, but they told us, no, we are having a very important delegation trying to change lives in California, so they have also chosen to change lives here. They were searching on the web, that is Professor Arthur Serwanga, so he linked with him, that is in 2013. So they shared ideas, the aim was correction and changing lives of enemies. <laughs> In the year 2008, I was sent on one year forced leave for changing a system in Imbarara prison from a punitive to correctional. I was sent home, but I said this is just the beginning. When I had already met my big brother, I was again sent on leave for resisting the relapse into the traditional system. You are the pillars who will change the system in your country. I am, I am gratified that Professor Renford invited me to the States to make a comparison of what I'm going to talk about. I saw your system, I visited CRC for some good hours, and I was trying to compare it with ours. And I tell you that other than Tarika and another one who had come, it would be America learns about Uganda. What you find is exactly the opposite of what obtains in your penal institutions. The problem you have is a lot of resources. That's your biggest problem. And our biggest problem is scarce of resources. But we are using the scarce resources to make the best out of it. I was incarcerated for 14 and a half years, three years parole, 17 and a half years in the California penal system. And so being able to travel to another country as an adult finally was amazing and just all the different challenges with that. But then heading to a prison and then walking in and then handing over our passports. I think that was extremely challenging because I've heard of so many stories of what happens if you don't have your passport. And then we're going into a prison, I think, the power of returning into that environment can be overwhelming for the formerly incarcerated if they're not grounded. Well, it was kind of shocking to, uh, when I first walked into Lazira, the conditions are radically different from anything I'd experienced in prisons in other countries. The, the sort of deprivation you see there, the, the, the sort of cooking facilities, and it was uh, uh, all um, uh, pretty remarkable, but I also immediately noticed that uh, how free I was to wander around. We were being escorted only by uh, inmates. Uh, um, uh, there were no staff uh, around, uh, and there was kind of a, a, a freeness uh, in terms of wandering around the prison with uh, these inmates that was very different from uh, uh, wandering suddenly around uh, an American prison. <laughs> So for the first day, we got in, we met the officials. As I said, when we walked in the prison, there were thousands of individuals walking in what was a soccer field or a grass field. And we met the officials and then we began to get a tour of the prison. And as we got a tour, I think the thing that stuck out the most was the relationship between the custody and those who were incarcerated. There was just this dynamic relationship. Here it is that you had the officers who were wearing less clothes than me. And there was a relationship you could see that had developed between the two groups. And I think it was a stark contrast to where in California you have this militarized presence 
in a very aggressive presence. Like they're not, they let you know they're not your friends. They have combat boots on, camouflage fatigues, the olive green, they have vest on, they have utility belt with all kinds of the handcuffs, the pepper spray, and the whole, their whole presence is already aggressive and threatening in that sense. And so to see this stark contrast and then to see the posters as we walked around to crush the offense and not the offender, I think was a very different vibe than what I have been to being in the California prisons. I've taught math courses both in Luzira prison in Uganda, but also at a, a prison facility in California where I live. I would say that in Luzira prison, there seemed to be a real commitment to rehabilitation just to a remarkable extent. And um, that's something that really stood out throughout our visit to Luzira Prison. I would say at the facility where I've served in California, um, many of the educational employees also have been very committed to helping the inmate students to grow. But I would say that at a um, high level overall facility perspective, I saw um, just a remarkable commitment to rehabilitation at Luzira Prison in particular. My first feeling when I walked on to, when I walked inside, seeing some of the things that they were selling that that were made by some people that was incarcerated. I remember thinking like, wow, like where are they doing the stuff at? Like, how is this happening? I've never been to a prison before where anything was being sold on behalf of anybody incarcerated. I was astonished. I just was like, okay, like, what is this? And I think to the right of us is a quote that kind of speaks to like what the mission of the prison is. And I remember naturally being maybe like ambivalent, thinking maybe it wasn't, uh, maybe there was some, there were some truths that wasn't being revealed through that particular like quote. But I think once we walked into the rooms and we talked to people like Anatoly and we, um, and we talked to like, I think the man who was the head of the prison at the time and he allowed for us to go into the spaces where the wood was and they were building right where the furniture was created, where we was able to go into the spaces where we saw the gentleman teaching his fellow folk complicated ideas of what I perceived to be like something like trigonometry. Right. When I'm seeing these things, I was and I'm seeing where they're making their food. I'm also seeing them on a soccer field. When I'm seeing all these elements, I was like, wow. I was like, wow, because there was a type of freedom that I think existed in that space that I had not seen in other cultural spaces. And I think the most powerful thing I sensed was this overall sense of care and humanity from the staff to the officers in relation to the incarcerator, right? To the inmates who were there. Even with the ones who were on death row, there was this, a sense of community. This idea that they understood that ho the hope was to help get these individuals out and prepare for life back home. And there was a sense of community, like I know you, I know your auntie, I know your family, I know your culture, I know your tribe. And there was always this recognition in that area which was starkly different than here where there's this separation where there's this almost us versus them you didn't get that sense in there the conversation the ability for the incarcerated to talk to the officers was as if just as if our team was talking to each other in fact it was more endearing than how some of us would talk to each other because we had more of this western bravado or a western edge to it where they had this very humble ability to talk to each other sometimes they would talk to each other so low it was almost a whisper and they were just very close they could be shoulder to shoulder no one looked at it like whoa is there funny business going on is there you know the snitching going on or any of that it just was like oh that's normal this is our normal and as i said with the uh, Charles and a few of the others who were given the authority to teach the classes, the authority that they were given to walk all the way up to the warden's office and walk in and have a conversation and then to go pick up supplies and then go back, 
you know, to teach the class. And then right outside the classroom, you have individuals working with full gardening tools. I'm not talking about the cheap kind. I'm talking about they had full axes, you know, the holes. They had all these things that would normally be considered weapons in the West. They were using it to chop firewood so they can cook for the entire population. And I was just this trust and respect at this level, which was the maximum security institution. This wasn't the lower level, like a level one. This was like the maximum, Lozier, maximum security. And this trust and respect that went across was mesmerizing. In terms of differences between the prison, Lozier and, and other prisons I've been into in, in Britain and in, in the United States, um, first thing I saw as we walked out onto the main yard was there was a goat just kind of milling around on, on the yard. And I thought, well, this is most unusual to see a goat uh, just walking around um, the facility. One of the things that really struck me when I went into the prison for the first time was how colorful and vibrant the environment was. And you know, that's not my typical experience of going into a prison, which can often seem drab and dull. This was just so much color with the yellow and the orange of the, of the clothing and the sort of red color of the soil of the clay in the yard area. And you know, oftentimes the men would be washing their clothes and you would have the yellow and orange uniforms sort of lying around and blowing in the wind and there would be the color of that as well. And it just really um, created a sense of a lot of movement and uh, just a sort of more dynamic feeling to the environment. Compared to our prisons here, Luzera is completely different. The atmosphere, the environment, um, is uh, very welcoming. It didn't even feel like a prison. So that's my first reaction. And when I say that, I mean, we walked in, we were greeted by the actual inmates. Um, and one thing that I loved about that prison is that although there are people serving time, they, the inmates are given a leadership role and they're allowed to um, greet and interact with the guests coming in. And I think immediately that built a sense of trust uh, for me in going into a, into a facility like that, seeing that the staff there trusted the inmates so well, that showed me that I could trust them. I know many of us noticed is um, there is no sense of fear that, that we saw. We did not see prisoners um, like seeming to be afraid of the officers. We saw the officers and the prisoners working together to maintain a peaceful environment where everybody could move forward. And um, while I obviously know that they're still traversing many of the violent ideas of incarceration, what I did see was that, right, someone had instrument, someone was able to cook, what I perceive to be a meal that is unique to their particular culture, right? And I was able to see people building from an impetus that I feel like is unique to their culture. I think those are some of the like human propensities that, that incarcerated spaces usually take away. And the guards didn't have weapons. I was, it felt promising that I was able to go into that space and to be myself to my fullest extent while also like being immersed in a type of love and a type of care and a type of intentionality that I had never experienced in the crossroads space. It was life changing for me. The first day was because um, the way that everyone who you came in contact with looked you in the eye, shook your hand, uh, put you in the best position to offer and to exchange the the, the highest amounts of energies. Beyond the communication and interaction was this idea of how were they able to do that. And I think what was powerful was learning about their training. The first three months of their training was unpaid. 
And the reason why it was unpaid, as I was told, was that they wanted to weed out people who didn't want to be part of this healing process. And when I say healing, this idea that the prison was a hospital, that they were the doctors and nurses, that those who were incarcerated coming in, they they were their purpose was to heal them and make them ready to be well again and get out to society. And so they wanted to weed out anyone who didn't have that agenda with the first three months of training. Then the next six months of training was paid, but it was low pay to the point of where the government had to subsidize their food, right? So this wasn't, you know, in the West, correctional officers, a position you want to get, like it's well paid, there's union, there's all this stuff that goes with it. If you're going to be a, an officer at Luzira, it wasn't going to be for the pay. Yeah, basically I could need school programs. Um, yeah, I could need school programs and provide security as well. Yeah, and take care of whoever comes here. And I thought that was just stunning to understand that they had this perspective that we want to help, we want to heal. This is our job to do that. When you enter the prison of Uganda, it is more or less like a home. This is the distinction of the, the white skinheads, the black gangs and all that, you not see it. It is more or less like, can I call it like a crowd? It is a home where there is proper intermixing between an inmate and a guard. I remember I met Lieutenant Moreno in the CRC. I asked him, why are these people moving in skirmishes as if it is a battlefield? That is not to say that our prisoners are simple. No. Our prisoners are very hard. One, they are illiterate, and you know dealing with an illiterate person is a problem. But we have developed in them a tenet of having freedom in themselves and understanding that we are not responsible for their offenses. And they have to appreciate that they are responsible by either commission or omission of whatever brought them into what? Into prison. So the moment they understand that one, that's how you realize the Mugero Jonathan and Pio Moses. What Mugero has not told you is that he was on death row. Jonathan was a death row prison. I don't remember where Pio Moses, but I think he was not. But he was a death row a condemned prisoner on a death row. What does that mean to you? You know it. But we have started a process of which you have become partakers of moving from criminal, turning these people from criminality to civility. And you cannot do it by punishing. Probably for me, the greatest experience I had while at Luzira was the opportunity to pray with the Muslim brothers on a Friday afternoon. To feel the community, the connection, the camaraderie was absolutely amazing. I think, you know, when I first landed, I was, I, I had a surreal type feeling. I mean, everything was surreal because it was my first time in Africa. Um, so... I felt immediately at peace. I felt uh, honored to be in the motherland. Um, and I was just really excited for the purpose and you know the opportunity that had been presented before us. Tara Masarata is my stage name, Tara Masarata. My team, I had been already, you know, volunteering with them for a year or so before, so we felt like a family. I think I was just in this state of peace. So they said, we can do that. That's what also Makere University Business School is doing. So they linked and connected ends. So Professor Arthur Serwanga introduced him to us, said we are going to work with you. So within just a year, they had started the program, which is now producing us. For us who are previously back, but again, we saw future because I could not imagine working on the same reasoning and uh, rubbing shoulders with professors. Said, now why do I go to crime again? Why do I go to disturb the communities? Let me move with them. If they have chosen to move with me, why should I refuse? 
So they go to volunteers like you, that is each year the summer period, they come and work with us. Terika Reswan was working with, the, I mean studying at Carl Paul Pomona, he came and worked with us. Professor Nigel gave me this by Nigel Boyel, and I was happy this time when he sent the daughter, that is Mole Boyel. So we've worked with them, the first group, it was nice, so we did not enter prison, but we moved with them and worked with them. So thank you for volunteering with the people. You change our lives. I remember that we had to walk down the stairs of the plane to the airport. So the first chance we got was to actually breathe the air. And there was a certain um, freshness or um, it didn't seem like it was uh, processed, as I would like to say. It was uh, this kind of a, a must, but a, a pleasant musk. And there was, um, it was a very warm, it was very hot as well. And I remember just touching down and just feeling like my feet were really firmly touching the ground. This was one of the first times where I had seen the majority or everybody being of African descent. And that was uh, very powerful and almost overwhelming, to be honest. The first thing I want to say is welcome. Welcome to Mother Africa. This is the uh, African Americans call it the motherland, but it's the motherland of everyone because it's the cradle of civilization. I hope everyone left their ego back in the, uh, in the United States. You come to teach, but you also come to learn. You know, I told you before, most people come to Africa to teach, to talk, to take. Few people come here to learn, right? They tell the driver to take them to the game park and take some photos of elephants and, and, and lions, and they go back to New York and Paris and London and they say they experienced Africa. Africa is not about an animal, Africa is about the people, right? And unless you interact with the people, you haven't experienced Africa. Feel free to learn. Be here to learn. And if anything, you should be having your small books. Whatever you see that pleases you, please jot it down. What you see that is new to you, put it down. What you feel that is peculiar that you've never seen in this so-called dark continent, I don't know whether we are dark. Possibly the skin is a bit dark, but we are very, very bright. Put it down. This is a land of plenty. This is the land of everything, where everything is natural. There is no GMOs. Feel free to visit, learn one word or two. We know your language. I'm speaking English. I'm just a Nyakole from South Western Uganda. Learn something about language, dressing, culture. Even look at the faces of people and see whether blacks are the same. First thing I realized was that what we call personal space here in America that's not their concern over there. We were all packed very tight. We were like literally, you know, arm over a person's shoulder. And the van was, uh, it was like an old school 70s uh, van, but it was, had seats. And so we had our whole group in there and there was no air conditioning. We had to have the windows open. And I remember just thinking, wow, this is amazing in the sense of, the privilege you realize you have or just um i think another word that came in was almost this antiseptic feeling like this was now suddenly you were close with people you were touching people so it was a long ride it was a bumpy ride but then we began to see the country and it was just amazing to see the country to smell the soil you can literally smell the soil and um i think the big thing was that with us as a group there was a certain bonding that was going on in the van because we weren't all sitting together necessarily on the plane. We had dirt roads and smaller houses and, you know, we began to see livestock everywhere. And we were able to see native wildlife, which was absolutely amazing.
then all of a sudden we pulled up and there was this gate with barbed wire on top and then this gate opened up and then we came into this paved area and these apartments that were about three or four stories tall and so it was a stark contrast to the environment that was around it this place that was you know designed and, and built the way it was and so i think that gave us a little bit of comfort for those of us who were used to you know creature comforts the idea about uh, life out of prison when uh, Anne is here and you meet other people who are going to work here they know the systems they know the environment they'll guide you i think they'll be better you'll have modesta you'll meet esther and ma much more during the the days the people either increasing or decreasing or changing according to the programs so stick by that and the team leader who's the team leader Chair. wow yeah he has been here. Yes, been yes. Here. welcome back. Uh, stick by him because most times we relate so closely and behind the scenes. So stick by him. Don't deviate from too much from what the group is doing. What I want to let you know is that every black African has a home. And I used to welcome my fellow African Americans back home. This is your home. My sister looks like my people. I come from southwestern Uganda. She looks like them. So, when we have these prisoners with us, we tell them, look, you are here. Accept to be here. If you say, I can't accept, you have problems with yourself. But the moment you accept that you are there, then you start the process of social reformation. I head primary section, secondary section, and I also coordinate university programs. And with university programs, we have uh, two universities so far. That is Makere University Business School, which is having the largest enrollment. Then we have also University of London, that is having around 10 students who are doing bachelor's of laws. You are welcome, and uh, really I'm very glad that you've come, because we, we have just finished with the first group. We ended on Thursday, and our students, so my students, are even waiting for you. Because now it is a culture that every year, June, or close May, we receive your people. And we almost feel glad that you've come. It is not accidental that I, Anatoly, and him, Gilbert, we are social workers. We have been the architects of social rehabilitation in Uganda prison service. I've been in the service for the last 22 years. I joined when I just completed university, I'm a, I'm a graduate of education and a graduate of social work. But I remember when I joined the prisons, my mother asked me a question that, are you stupid enough to go and work with prisoners? I told her, my, uh, my mother, I think I am not stupid to that level, but let me try my best. And I see whether I shall make an impact. I think I have made it. I, this is not about bringing my own conscious, but I have made it together with others. One, you have to tell a prisoner or an inmate to appreciate that he either committed an offense or a situation happened to him. This is when he begin the process of healing. And this is why I salute Professor Renford and, and group for bringing in the concept of healing and forgiveness. Whom do you forgive? The first person you forgive is yourself. The moment you start by forgiving the other ones, you may end up not forgiving yourself. So the process of healing starts with the concept of forgiveness. And when you start the process of saying, I, I can forgive, that's what I mean by forgiving yourself. When you say, I can forgive, it means that you have opened your heart to positivity. Our prisoners, are very hard. They are the hardest. One, they come from poor backgrounds. Very, very poor. Where we grew up from, some of us, we saw, we, we put on shoes when we were around like 10 years, during the, the time when Uganda was in wars and all that. Some people are still living in grass-touched houses. Some of you have never seen it. Some of you, some of us grew, grew up looking after goats. The other day, Molly was telling me that she has never seen a goat. I wish I could work out to my home district to see goats. So that is the situation of the prisoners whom we have. But how do we change them? 
Changing a mindset is a process. And I believe what is lacking in your prisons is mindset changing. But the Chinese are saying that the journey of a thousand miles starts with just a single stride. And this is why Professor Renford and Arthur are telling you that come here to learn. I have always admired his statement, my big brother. He said that when people come from the north, on reaching and taking international airport, they jump on the safari to go to Queen Elizabeth National Park, the independent rebel, magician falls and Kidepo, sea lions, buffaloes, baboons. Africa is made up of human beings mm -hmm. with a lot of intellect and ability to change the world. Mm -hmm. And so, let us all learn from each other and know that whether black or yellow or green, if at all there is a human being who is green, what runs in our, in our veins and arteries is the same red blood. So that means that we are one and the same. What changes us is the skin color. But the moment you peel off the skin color, we remain the same what? Same person. So that is the concept of humanity which brings you here. How you doing? My name is Ryan Harris. I represent Cal State San Bernardino, Group 2, Pep Uganda. All right, so far the biggest thing that stuck out to me is just how tropical and lush everything is. It's such a far cry, it's so, so much different than what we're used to. Where you think that when you come out here, everything's supposed to be, you know, what you see on TV, when it's not really it. You can't really say anything unless you come out here and experience it for yourself. Right, the people are beautiful, their mentalities are beautiful. Oh, walking through the prisons, I know this is slightly, this may be odd, but honestly I feel at home. It felt like peace, like I meant to be here. Uh, even though I was in a prison, I feel like I got all of Africa within that one visit. And so, I'm just beyond excited. Today is our very first day. Uh, we're going there with the intention to help, to teach, but to also practice what they have taught us within less than 24 hours, which is love. Njagaramere. I want food and so he cook for him as if he had no hands. Umbutu. If I eat, you eat together through Gende, through Gende, we go, we go. And amidst the sorrow and poverty, all we see is each other, no brother, no kin, just bondage through ancestry. Like, when I told yesterday, nigga, like, here in Uganda, guys use that word if, I, if, if you want to call him, hey nigga, come on. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. So I, I didn't know that they mean different no color, no skin, just two hands, stranger, no stranger, they greet. I say love, he said, you mean Kwagala. It is used to be derogatory historically. However, it has been reappropriated by modern culture to mean something to modern culture. And when I say reappropriated, it means it meant something and then the culture has re-owned it. So now I just say Kwagala and they repeat Luganda as their native language. But as we know, both slavery and colonization started here. So it's it has a historical connotation that is negative. But to, uh, to weaken that, more modern people have taken it back and use it the way they want to use it now. Even though we have taken it and owned it as far as black people are concerned, we still as a people get offended when people outside of our culture use it. Mainly a white person. I'm just gonna be real about it. Mainly, mainly a white person because the white man created that word to bring us down. But being realistic, the word's not going anywhere. Right, so for the most part, that's absolutely right. We reappropriated it for our own use. And even in our own use, just like any other word, depending on the, the way you use it in the sentence, it can still be derogatory from me as a black man to another black man. Or it can be something, like you said, like it could just mean man, it could mean brother, it could mean whatever. 
just depending on whichever way you decide to use it. I wonder if the British ever apologize. I wonder if they'd accept it. My fellow Ugandans try so hard to speak English, but they know culture. Far from being derooted or how I wish I knew my first language. The system is perpetuating this madness. It's still spreading. No slavery, just slave. We embrace it. My son must learn another language. This dialect is corruption in need of reconstruction. I heard the last reconstruction made slavery invisible. How convenient. And if religion is a drug, he who lacks melanin grab my ancestors wrists searched for a vein tapped at it until it created a big enough target for the needle to penetrate and then watched for at least one of us to desolate i imagine him purposely giving us a dosage the human body can't function with but stronger it only made us stronger i see the edge in my people rigid with nice curves and muscle definition i never knew the back of my queens to be so strong she's been carrying her eight month child for some time now steadily picking up her crops as she prepares for today's work She'll be lucky to sell two dollars worth of corn. She's been living off a dollar a day for who knows how long. And they wonder why I speak for the unfortunate. I've always known unfortunate and the corrupted to be synonymous. There's no way he has a house on the hills in view of the whole city. And his people are starving, walking miles for fresh water. The disparity between the rich and the poor ain't just prevalent in America. You see, corruption has a voice everywhere. Weatherly. I have this class, the History and Politics of World Football or World Soccer, depending on where I'm teaching it, which uh, is my silver bullet class. It works uh, uh, anywhere around the world. And so when Professor Reese uh, uh, suggested I go teach uh, at the Zero, I, I thought I'd try this class. And I heard that there were soccer leagues uh, inside um, uh, the prison. Um, but I sort of designed this as a two-week class on the history and politics of world uh, football and uh, went in and uh, immediately realized that there was a great deal of enthusiasm about this. But I quickly realized, too, it went beyond just a passive interest in football as a game, but that football, uh, uh, soccer inside uh, Luzira prison was, was kind of central to how the whole prison uh, operated, how the inmates kind of organized themselves. He's the person in Luzira who's probably been featured the most. He was in this article written by uh, David Goldblatt that was in The Guardian. The Guardian is one of the biggest newspapers in Europe, the biggest newspaper in uh, the UK. He was featured there. He was the feature of Vice. Vice did a documentary on soccer in Luzira prison. So he was a feature of, because he was the one that ran the whole soccer operation. It's like a Premier League. Uh, they have uh, Manchester United, they have Liverpool, they have Aston Villa, they have all the teams that they have in the, uh, the Premier League in, uh, in England. So he ran that for uh, how many years? 12? 12 years. Okay. I eventually worked with uh, some of the guys inside and they gave me kind of a history of uh, soccer inside the prison, which goes back a decade. And it's kind of how uh, the guys inside, st again, started to organize themselves and ha started to sort of interact with uh, the, um, uh, the prison leadership. Um, and so uh, the, uh, uh, what the key was that the, the soccer league was the way in which uh, uh, the inmates sort of self or organized. They organized into different clubs, but they had to uh, make sure that uh, they had to avoid conflicts, uh, for example. So they started developing elaborate uh, systems to resolve conflicts, to prevent uh, fights between players, to regulate the behavior of fans. There are like 3,000 fans will show up for, to, to watch these games, uh, but also to regulate the behavior of, of players. And it kind of um, uh, mushroomed from there. So there were 10 uh, clubs, uh, and all named after major European professional uh, uh, clubs. Um, and uh, um, so guys were organized into these league and as it, it developed, they, they began sort of mimicking the way in which the actual uh, uh, major leagues uh, in Europe operated. So there was a transfer system whereby clubs would transfer players from one to another. There will be transfer pricing for uh, players that, that, that would be involved. Um, very interestingly, the, the units of currency inside a Lazira um, um, uh, prison were bars of soap and uh, um, uh, bags of sugar. Uh, and so this is these uh, 
players were traded uh, between the different clubs using uh, these uh, commodities. <laughs> scientists, it was a very impressive uh, organizational structure that they put together and it was fascinating for me just to see the way in which they'd adapted what they uh, were aware of from the outside but applied it to this uh, very unusual setting inside the prison. Come on, come on guy. For me to play in the game, one of the players in the facility gave me their, uh, the shirt, the shorts, the cleats. It, it was just an incredible experience for them to show me that kind of love, to give me their uniform, their jersey. Uh, I sub in with one of the inmates. I was coming into a premier championship league type of game. The intensity was strong. The guys were playing this game seriously. Uh, they gave me no chances. As soon as I got in there, they started playing like they wanted to win and it was everything for them. It's quite a, a remarkable experience, definitely the highlights, uh, playing in a maximum security facility. Brotherhood, we stand together. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Brotherhood, we stand together. Brotherhood, we stand together. Brotherhood, we stand together. Only one move. Only one move. Only one move. At the moment, they are starting in the partnership. As a That's right. We teach in introduction to entrepreneurship, and it was mainly about relating the skills of an entrepreneur to the uh, students in there, the inmate students that were really engaged and, and wanted to know about business ideas, business plans, uh, their small business uh, microfinancing, and how they can finance their, their business idea uh, from the inside and also when they get released. So we did a, a, a learn by doing approach. We taught inside the classroom how to create a business plan. We taught how to make candles with one participant bringing that idea. We talk about the production of goods. They took us to their production site on site. So it was really hands-on, um, having them share their, their ideas, what they already had in mind, and then cultivating those to making sure that they had the right course of action and the right financing. Finance. So it was mainly about introducing their ideas to us and having them develop a business plan for them to execute that, that, that idea once they were released. So when I went into Lizera Prison, I taught a calculus class. Mathematicians start with what they know, and then we get questions like, what if it is that function instead? And then from there, it opens up other things, like if we can talk about that, what if we have this kind of thing? From there, Um, I had not realized ahead of time that my students would be um, the highest academic level inmates at the facility and so as we got into the class I learned that all of my inmate students had taken calculus um, in their previous schooling but it was still uh, such a powerful opportunity for us to do mathematics together. Um, in my classes, I, I think of my students and myself as colleagues that were working together in exploring the course material. And so, as much as possible, that's what we did in the calculus class in Lizera Prison. We also did a healing and forgiveness class, which I thought was very powerful, but there was this dynamic of learning cultural differences. Like in the West, we have this healing without almost a forgiveness, without a reconciliation, and they could not understand that. And I thought that was powerful because for them, when you forgive, there's reconciliation. You have to repair the relationship as it was before. And so that was one dynamic among many that came up that we had to make adjustments in uh, cultural understanding.
Um, for many years now, I've used to, I'm used to being a professor in the classroom with all the technology at my disposal, so my PowerPoint slides, internet connection, all of that. And of course, anytime you teach in a prison, you don't have those kinds of resources. But I felt um, all the more so at this prison in, in Luzera. Um, you know, I was very much just using the chalkboard and I just found you had to be really much more creative and much more resourceful in the way that you taught under those circumstances. And so I think it was really a good experience and a good reminder for me as a professor, you know, to think about um, whether I'm teaching in a classroom at, at the University in California where I work or wherever it might be, to not be overly reliant on modern technology and to, to think about other ways you can engage the students. So, so that was a fun and, and great challenge. I taught poetry. Uh, my, 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 uh, our spoken word, if you will, um, fundamental principles of poetry, right? Uh, att attempting to teach them like stanza, simile, metaphor, alliterations. How's everybody doing? Good, good, good. good. All right, so, so one rule, I will greet y'all saying Quagala. I just asked y'all say Quagala back. And we use nature as like our entry point to allow for them to kind of imagine and to build in the moment. And so everything that we did was associated with colors as it related to like natural life. So we was focusing on the color blue, right? We had them think about rain. We had to think about water. We had to think about, you know, um, the sky. Write whatever you want to write, however you want to write it. But take yourself to a happy place. So for you, if it's eating fruit, write about eating fruit. If it's for you, if it's about music, write about writing music. If it's for you, if it's about love, write about love. What we're doing right now is you're using our imagination. However you want to get there, right? And as we get there, then we're going to start creating the foundation. We're going to give y'all art forms, lettering, how to put poetry, how to put poetry into different segments so that it's more structured. That makes sense. So what I did was have them write a poem each day, um, leading up to like their final poem, where it would be comprised of like 24 lines, which I think ended up being like four to five stanzas or, or five to six stanzas, um, that they would get the opportunity to present at their, at their culmination event. Um, and what I got was songs. What I got was Full um, duets between people who were incarcerated. On the last day, we had like this showcase that was similar to like an open mic where we're from, and people brought in drums, people brought in guitars. Um, you know, people were singing. They learned. They, they taught me their cultural songs. And And they, and they were circling around us. Everybody got in the middle and we had a circle around that person and we was giving them energy and we was like, you know, dancing and, and rapping with them and doing all these things. I want food. Yes. And so he cooked for me as if I had no hands. Um, if I eat, you eat. Together through Gin Day, through Gin Day, we go, we go. And amidst the sorrow and happiness, all we see is each other. No brother, no kin, just bondage through ancestry. No color, no skin, just two hands. Stranger, no stranger, they greet. He said, Love. He said, You mean Kwagala? So now we just say Kwagala and they repeat Luganda is their native language. But as we know both slavery and colonization started here, I wonder if the British ever apologized. It was an amazing experience and, and, and I've tried to replicate that experience since every time I went back to Uganda. And every time I went back to Uganda, something has happened to push it over the top. Because 
because we're serving in Luzera, a maximum security prison, these people are there, right, for five, 10, 20 years, right? So we went back and it's like we were reconnecting with old friends. Um, and so they were continuing to develop and harness their skills as poets. And we felt that every time we went back um, because the depth and the complexities of what it is they was expressing to us, it continued to expand and to grow. to the female prison uh, it was definitely a different experience it was another pleasant experience in terms of seeing the culture and the atmosphere in the women's prison I saw women walking around holding their babies and this actually brought me to tears um, it was very emotional for me to understand that we don't have to take away our children from mothers, right? Just because they're incarcerated. In addition to teaching in the, the men's top security facility, I also taught in the women's section. There I was working together with some of my teammates and we taught sort of an empowerment and self-discovery type of course to um, a small number of the, the female inmates and that was a remarkable experience as well. Um, it's a facility unlike any place I've ever seen before because um, there was a lot of life in that facility. The women were able to share with us um, some of their cultural background, um, including cultural songs and drumming and dances. And we would be outside in a green field um, as the women shared these things with us. And it would be hard to remember the, the reality that we all were together inside a prison experiencing this. For me, music is medicine to the spirit, to the soul, and in Uganda, song was just so powerful. And I know in, in our classes, we taught creative writing and poetry, but the women would just uh, break out in song and harmony, all a cappella, right? We didn't have instruments. West from West. The next dance is from the West, <laughs> from a place called Unyoro. Unyoro. <laughs> the dance is called Togoro. Children have such a passion in them to where no matter what's going on around them, 
there's always uh, joy and ambition inside of them that can't be taken away. So for me, I worked with middle school. It was seventh and eighth graders, I believe. And they were so inquisitive and just so um, wise beyond their years that I, I think about them still to this day. I remember the interaction. We had them write letters, write poetry. We also did an exercise, it was a smart exercise, where, where we had them write their goals. And the goals that the youth came up with, I mean, I didn't think of these type of goals until I was in college, right? So it's just a reflection of, of the ambition and the, the, the genius mind that they have. I remember going into Shure Prospect School and uh, when I walked into the room and introduced myself, um, I said, Kwagala, why are you saying Kwagala? And I said, well, in Luzira, that's how I introduced myself. And you know, in the, in the gentleman in Luzira, they said it back to me. They said Kwagala too, this term of endearment is something that I enjoy. They said, you know what Kwagala means? I said, yeah, I know it means love. And they said, okay, well, Kwagala. And I said, can y'all teach me what it means to be humble? What, what touched me was that they didn't separate kids or based on their special needs. So all of the special needs kids were in the same class with um, the general learning kids. And so there was one girl, young girl who didn't have hands and she drew, she wrote with her toes. I mean, and her penmanship was beautiful. You would never know. But the other children were assisting her, were helping her. I mean, and it just shows how the school atmosphere can just be great when you have all kids working together, no matter what their needs are, what their learning uh, capabilities are. At the end of the class, the kid asked me if they could sing a song and they started singing a praise and worship song. It was a hymnal and they taught me the hymnal on the spot. Um, it was just extremely moving. It was, it was, it was an out of body experience. I told them that you are very good at dancing and they are interested in seeing how you dance and then perhaps they will also dance for us and show us strokes. Everybody who was allowed us to have the space here. As I speak, our dear guests are with us in this house. Ladies and gentlemen, you are most welcome. I am Zah. So good seeing you. Oh, okay, well, it's good seeing you. you again. Thanks for taking care of us. Yeah, again. welcome. Thank, thank you for you, appreciating. You. We shall keep in touch, Bam. Absolutely. Yeah, safe then is right. Okay, thank yeah, you. Welcome. Bye. Yeah, man, thank you so bye. much. Hello, bye. See you next year. Yeah, next year, sure. Next year. Hope you will come all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah.
see you. We go, we go. So the exchange was rich on both sides. Um, every day that I've spent in Uganda, and I've been there, I think, four times. So, uh, and I miss it today still. Inspiration is his sole purpose, and agony is what inspired me. Ife Nara. His origins date back to the African diaspora long before King had a dream. Centuries before the world knew Billy Hanna, they can sing. Poetry served as a hidden mechanism for the sick. One act what it means to be poet, and I replied there was no definition. No rules, no regulations. This here ability to congregate words is a lifestyle, a movement. And one can become so in tune with this craft that his words become a weapon. I wrote my first poem on a bus ride to Los Angeles. So you can say that this here sound is authentic. Caution. Please proceed with caution. This is dope, bro. This is so dope. This is crazy. 